before Dr. Tara Rye Trent became Oprah's favorite guest of all time, she was a woman with a forgotten dream. As a young girl in a village in Zimbabwe, she dreamed of receiving an education, but instead was married young and by 18, without a high school diploma, she was already a mother of three. But then Tara Rye encountered a visiting American woman who assured her that anything was possible, and this reawakened Tara Rye's sacred dream. Dr. Tara Rye Trent is one of the most internationally recognized voices for quality education and women's empowerment today. She's the author of The Awakened Woman, Remembering and Reigniting Our Sacred Dreams, a book that shares her story of how she planted her dreams deep in the earth and then prayed that they would grow and break the cycle of oppression of women today. And this is a conversation that I got to have, I guess, two years ago now. It is one of my favorite conversations uh, we've gotten to have on the podcast. This is kind of an underrated episode, uh, despite the fact that Dr. Trent is literally Oprah's favorite guest of all time. Like, that's remarkable. That's wild. But I hope that if this is your first time hearing this episode, that it blows your mind. And that if it's your second time, that you find another nugget of truth and wisdom within it, because it's so beautiful. Truly, everything that Dr. Trent says feels like kind of a sacred truth. It's mesmerizing and eloquent, and I think you're going to love her. I love her so much. Dr. Trent has this thing that she says, and I absolutely love it. She says, my story is not about me, but it's about what can come out of my story. And I think that's beautiful. And and kind of a little update on what's happened with Tara Rice since this conversation. She's continued to uh, educate. She's a professor at Drexel University. Uh, and her book, this book that we kind of talk about that encapsulates a lot of this story of hers, it ended up being named the Outstanding Literary Work at the 49th NAACP Image Awards, which is truly remarkable. I'm Brandon Harvey, and this sounds good. This is the weekly podcast where we have conversations with inspiring people who are rejecting cynicism and using their lives to make an impact. Over the next little bit, we are re-airing our old favorite episodes while we work on something new and exciting to share with you. Uh, So I hope you enjoy. Get ready to be inspired, and let's see what Terrorized Story brings out of yours. I want to bring it back to the beginning and and I want to know what your community in Zimbabwe was like growing up. You know, what are, you know, take me back to the community that you grew up in. What did it feel like? What did it smell like? What was, what did it sound like? What was the experience for you? Oh, thank you for having me here. I grew up um, in a country that was known back then as Rhodesia before we gained our independence. And today the country is known as Zimbabwe. I grew up in a small rural uh, community where there was, and still there is no running water, uh, there is no electricity. uh, But it was fascinating for me as a young girl because I I would go to uh, help graze cattle and go to the fields. And in the evenings, um, we would sit around and open fire and listen to these beautiful stories from my grandmother and my mother and the women from the community, the stories of surviving in a war because I was also born during the war that liberated my country. And I grew up, uh, you know, listening to these gunfires and uh, being afraid that at any time our community, our village uh, would be bombed and things like that. Uh, But there was always hope because the women would always ingrain in me that uh, life will always be better and uh, you can work hard uh, in your own life. So that's the kind of environment in which I grew up. Yeah. And you had this sense of hope, which is absolutely beautiful. But I also know that growing up as a woman in Rhodesia at the time was was certainly really, really difficult. There's a lot of 
mistreatment of women and a lot of uh, inequality. What is it like specifically to grow up as a woman in Rhodesia? You know, the silencing of women uh, in my life, I experienced it at a very young age because I remember the, 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 the men were more educated than, than the women. And, uh, you know, I grew up with my grandmother. My grandmother was this midwife and she would be called by the community to go and deliver babies without the ability to read and write. She would rise from her small heart and go and deliver hundreds of, of babies. And, um, and then I would watch, there's a story that stuck with me, the story of my aunt Chida, because during the war, the men would go out away from the village, afraid of uh, the Rhodesian soldiers, and they would go and seek employment elsewhere or join uh, the freedom fighters. And their means of communication were letters that would be sent home to these women who could not read. So my aunt Chida would always ask me to go and find someone to read a letter from her husband. And I would and I was around six, seven years old, and I would trail behind my aunt to find that reader. And we find this young man who reads the letter. And I'm listening to the most intimate details of that letter. And I'm thinking, I don't want anybody to read my personal letters. My aunt did not believe the first reader. She would say, let's go to the next person and find if we can uh, collaborate what is being said here. And, and we go in and find someone to read. And by the time we return to the village, every jig and jail, every, every Jack and Jill knew the contents of that letter. Gosh! And so those disparities amongst women and men were never far away from my mind. And I, I, I knew at a very young age that I didn't want that kind of life. But, you know, as I always uh, share with some of my audience that I come from a long line of generations of women, women who had been married very young, uh, young before they could define their own dreams. My great-grandmother uh, was married to my great-grandpa and she became the fifth wife and it was a polygamous relationship and she was young and yet did not have the opportunity to go to school and define what she wanted in her life. My grandmother would follow the same pathway and my mother and myself, we would follow the same pathway. But my grandmother wanted to instill in me as well as my mother that I can break this cycle, this vicious cycle that is shaped by uh, early marriages, illiteracy, poverty. And I, and I always think that my great-grandmother was born in a relay, a relay that I call the baton, where she's holding a baton, the baton of poverty, the baton of early marriage, the baton of a colonial system that was oppressive. And she runs in that relay holding that baton. She hands it over to my grandmother. My grandmother holds that baton of oppression. She ran so fast with that baton. She hands it over to my mother. My mother grabs that baton. She runs so fast and she hands it over to me. But there was magic in that story. Soon after independence, a woman from Hefa International, her name is Jo Luck, came to my village. I was in the middle of running with my own baton. My girls were growing, and I knew if I don't get an education, I was going to hand over the same baton that had been handed over by generations of women. And this woman asked me one fundamental question, what are your dreams? And did you ever been asked that question before? No. Wow. I had no idea that women are supposed to dream. All I knew was the silencing of women, the oppression of women. And when I opened my mouth, I became a chatterbox. And I told <laughs> her, 
I want to have an education. She said, what kind of an education? And by then, because our country had gained independent and we could have all these foreigners and local educated people coming into our communities doing what they were calling research. And I could hear the men and women talking about Bachelor of Sciences, uh, Masters, PhD, and I, and, and I wanted that. So I said, I want to have an undergraduate degree. I want to have a Masters. I want to have a PhD. Jo Luck looked at me and she said, if you believe in these dreams and you work hard, it is achievable. That was an inspiration to me. Joe Luck had no idea that here I was uh, expecting my fifth child and uh, with no high school diploma, and she's giving me a hope to have a PhD. Oh, my goodness, she must be kidding me. I ran to my mother, and I said, Mother, I met someone who made me believe I can have my education. That was music to my mother's ears. And your mom had passed you this this baton and the, this cycle, but she was still hopeful that you might be the person to break that cycle, which is, that's amazing. One thing that we underestimate amongst the poor people and the uneducated people, we think they are poor, they are uneducated, they are not critical thinkers. No, they realize their situation. They they know the gateway out of poverty. And my mother and my grandmother, they knew that the rising of women through education, through empowerment, is the only gateway for women to empower themselves and their communities. So my mother said, if you truly believe in what this woman, this stranger has said to you and you work hard and you achieve all your dreams, not only are you going to define who you are, but you are defining every life that comes out of your womb and generations to come. So my mother said, bury your dreams deep down in the ground. You know, I come from a culture where when a child is born, they snip the child's umbilical cord or the birth cord and they take the mother's old dress and they cut off a small piece. They tie that umbilical cord in the mother's dress and they bury deep down in the ground where the child is born with the belief that when this child grows, Wherever they go, whatever happens in their life, the umbilical cord will always remind them of their birthplace. So my mother said, the same way we believe in the power of the earth, the same way we believe in the power of the umbilical cord, write down your dreams and bury them deep down in the ground. Wherever you go, despite Despite the abuse you are facing in your life, despite the challenges in your life, those buried dreams will always remind you of their importance. And so I wrote down my dreams and I was ready to bury them when my mother said, would you mind to read those dreams? And when I did, she said something so profound, your dreams will have greater meaning when they are tied to the betterment of your community. I looked at my mother and I'm thinking, what does that even mean? My mother was this quiet woman and she repeated the same thing. And I would end up writing my fifth dream. When I'm done, I want to come back and improve the lives of women and girls in my own community and abroad. So they don't have to go through what I had gone through. So I buried my dreams. Wow. Okay. And so to recap, you know, I've got your book right in front of me. Those dreams you wanted to, number one, go to America. Number two, to get an undergraduate degree. Number three, to get a master's degree. Number four, to get a PhD. And then the fifth one that your mom added was Five, to give back to my community, especially to alleviate the plight of women and girls. 
Yes, and that was the sacred dream. Mm. In many ways, my mother was reminding me that it's not about our personal goals in life. It's not about our personal dreams in life. It's not about the degrees that we post on in our offices or in our homes, but it is about how those personal dreams and those personal goals and the education connected to the greater good. That's the secret to our success. And that's the sacred dream that we should all embody, that we should all have, because it's about allowing others to stand on our shoulders as they allow us to stand on their shoulders. And so you buried these in the ground, but obviously this isn't like immediately changing things for you. It's not like you buried in the ground and then all of a sudden outsprouts a degree. Uh, you're in a really difficult context at this point. And, you know, I, I read your book and I, I absolutely loved it. And I know that this time in your life was a, a time of, of heartbreak. You yes. uh, you were back in your mother's village, uh, but that's not where you had been living the last few years. Can you, like, give me a little bit more context on the difficult situation that you were in when you committed to this, like, audacious dream? I was a young mother married to this abusive man. And when were you married again? How old? I was around 14. By the wow. time I was 18, I was already a mother of four. And one of the uh, babies died as an infant because I could not produce enough milk. I was a child myself. And so this was the period, the darkest period of my life. But the bearing of my dreams, my mother was priming me, priming me to understand in the power of my mind and the power of my subconscious that when I bury my dreams, I'm not just burying them because they are dead. I'm burying them so they can sprout and begin to yield success for me. It took me eight years to gain my uh, all levels, which is equivalent to a high school diploma uh, or a GED. Eight years. And these were eight years of never giving up, eight years of failing, uh, and also eight years of uh, trying to find the tuition that I needed because I was going through correspondence classes to pay the next class. And during that time, we were still under the British uh, system of education where I would write my uh, courses and go to the post office, mail them to British, to a place called Cambridge, and where they would grade my papers and I would receive them after three or six months and I find myself, I have failed and I would go back to the desk and I would write and I would go back and send uh, my coursework up until I achieved my GED. Wow. And that was the first step towards your next goals. Yes. And to say that uh, uh, it requires um, patience, it requires uh, uh, work and the attitude of never giving up. And after I did my GED, I was accepted at Oklahoma State University where I then uh, achieved my undergraduate and later on, uh, I did my undergraduate in, in agriculture. Well, not to mention, it brought you to America, which was goal number one. Yes, yes. It brought me to America. And uh, and then I did my master's. And after my master's, I uh, I, I found a job with Hefa International where I would <laughs> meet. I just want to say, Tara, I like... You are just like breezing through this like it wasn't a big deal. But goodness gracious, let's just back up for a second because this is incredible. You grew up in a small community in Zimbabwe where you didn't have running water or electricity. Mm -hmm, and then mm -hmm. maybe we should even back up and just say like, what was the process of like moving to America like? You know, you got accepted to a school, but you still had to buy, I would imagine, a plane ticket, probably Oklahoma's kind of cold sometimes. Like you probably had to like get a cut. Like what was that process like? I'm sorry for like jumping back, but like it's just no. like you're amazing and, 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 and no. you're just like 
breezing through it like it's no thing. <laughs> and, and no, 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 no. It, it was the most difficult time. But, you know, I had others who stood by me. And uh, it wasn't like uh, it was an easy process. And I had children and I, I didn't want to leave my children in Zimbabwe. And, oh boy, I got a job. My first job was cleaning for this bus company where I would go on my knees and clean and scrub for the bus conductors and the and the drivers that were passing through. And the money was just minimum for me to survive. But I learned on that I needed to save every penny that I could have because I had a dream. So I saved all that. And so when I finished my uh my high school diploma i and applying for uh coming to the us it took me a long time of saving my money as you read in the book out I, i would save it under pillows i would give it to relatives i would do anything because i was afraid my husband he would find the money and take it from me and so after i had enough money for my airfare, I realized I had enough for me and my kids, but there was $640 that was short for my own part of the airfare because we were allowed not only to buy a one-way ticket, we had to buy a two-way ticket. America needed to be assured that I would come back home. And so my, my, my community, they ended up coming together and selling chickens and guavas and mangoes for me to get that $640 to go to America. And on the other hand, my husband was refusing me to get the visa for the children because in Zimbabwe that time, for you to get a passport, your husband has to sign for that passport and to get a visa, you have to have the passport. So I was in a very difficult position and I begged him and he said, no, you're not taking my children. If you want to go because you think you are smart, you can go. But the whole reason for me to go to America was to break that cycle to bring the children with me. And uh, so I ended up uh, asking some of his relatives to intervene. And, uh, you know, he ended up accepting with the condition that he will come with me. So I, I came with him to America and the abuse still continued. And uh, thank goodness, um, I was uh, saved by the American police. <laughs> they found him beating me and uh, he was given a mandate to go back home and uh, never to go with the children. And so he remained in America uh, with the children where I then uh, pursued my, my master's. And uh, it was also a tough time because here I was in, an international student um, with no... Uh, sources for um, scholarships. So I ended up working three jobs and attending attending school. But there was a fire in me, a fire never to give up. My subconscious, I believe, I, I had primed it for, for success. The dreams that I had buried deep down in my village, I could I could hear them. I could feel them. I knew I needed to uh, fulfill these these dreams, and I need I needed to uh, break this cycle, and uh, have my own children um, have an education. So when I got a job with Hefa International, my first trip was to go home, and I went to the place that I had buried my dreams, and I dug them up. And it was still buried there. Yes, they were still buried there. Wow! I dug those dreams. And I marked, go, you know, going to America, marked, achieved my undergraduate, achieved my master's, and I reburied my dreams because I could see two dreams still needing to be achieved, the dream of having a PhD and the sacred dream of giving back to my community. And I came back to the U.S. 
and I enrolled myself at Western Michigan University where I achieved my PhD in evaluations, uh, which is measurements and statistics, looking at, looking at um, uh, development and aid and the impact of international programs. I remember the day that I walked to receive that uh, PhD. It had taken me 20 years from the day I buried my dreams. And to receive that PhD, mm, mm, I could feel and I could sense my great-grandmother standing in one corner, my grandmother standing in another corner, my mother in another corner, and my paternal grandmother standing in another corner, surrounding me. And I felt like I had a closing statement. If we give education opportunities to those who are torn down and marginalized by the social ills of our time, they can achieve their dreams. If we give opportunities to women and girls, it is the best investment that we can do to the society. It was through the shoulders of others that I stood on. I stood on the shoulders of giant to recognize and to realize this moment. Without others, I would not be there. And then, you know, after I received my PhD, I realized that uh, there was no way I could achieve the fifth dream. And I kept on saying, Mother, why did you make me write that fifth, <laughs> <laughs> that fifth dream? Why? Was your mom still alive? Was she able to celebrate this? Oh, yes. Good, yes, good. Yes. And, you know, and, and, and an idea came. And I remember Jolak, when she visited she in the village, she said, uh, it is achievable. And she used this word, tinogona, which is uh, a Shona word for it is achievable. So I said, I'm going to design my T-shirts and I'm going to, I have the words tinogona, it is achievable on these T-shirts and I'm going to sell these T-shirts and get millions of dollars and go home and uh, build schools and improve the lives of women and girls. Well, I only sold 20 T-shirts <laughs> and mostly to my friends, my American friends. And I realized that I didn't have a marketing degree and uh, I was devastated. Then I got a phone call, the memorable phone call of my life, the call from Oprah Winfrey. And she donated $1.5 to my sacred dream. And I knew all along, my mother and my grandmother, they knew the secret to our success. They knew it. And here I was, and today... You know, in partnership with Oprah Winfrey, we have managed to rebuild 11 schools and benefiting 6,000 children in the process who are receiving quality education. And, and, and as I reflect back and I realize, you know, it's not only me. There are many women who have walked this same process, who have refused to be silenced, who are reawakening and reigniting their own dreams. And I had to find them. And they told me stories that inspired me more. And I wanted to write a book to share my own story, but also to weave their own stories and to recognize the giants who allow me, who looked straight into my eyes and allowed me to be who I am today. Oh my goodness. That's absolutely, that's incredible. I want to go back to this moment with Oprah because I watched this moment because this actually happened on the Oprah show when she donated this money. And Oprah has spoken extensively about how uh, 
her time with you is like time that she cherishes. You're her favorite guest of all time on the Oprah Winfrey show. Um, and you're too humble to, uh, uh, to say that right now, but she had an incredible experience with you. And so you get this call from Oprah Winfrey and she's like, come on the show and you show up on the show. What were you processing through at the time? What were you thinking? Were you nervous, excited? You know, it was a memorable experience for her. No doubt the same for you, but in a different way. What was that like? You know, I can't even describe the feeling. It was just unbelievable. And even up to now, when I think about it, when I talk about it, it brings these emotions of of joy, but also uh, emotions of recognizing that, yes, if our dreams are mission-driven, we can never go wrong. There are always angels like Oprah. There are always those giant sisters and giant brothers who can see through in us and be there and help us and uplift our dreams. You know, when I sat on that, um, uh, in that chair with Oprah, I was nervous. I had no idea what was going to come because uh, in my previous discussion with the producer, he had said, uh, this is not the time for you to talk about your your dreams. You know, Oprah is hosting you and many other people, so be gracious. And so I went in and I'm thinking, <laughs> Oprah is not going to talk about my, my dreams and I'm not going to talk about that. So now when I walked in and I could see these two, ch- you know, seats, hairs and mine, and I'm thinking, so what am I going to say? And when she said, now, what are your dreams? Oh, my goodness. I, oh, boy, oh, boy. I I wanted to rush straight to the bathroom because I could not contain myself. (laughs) It was just, oh, boy, oh, boy. And when I said, I want to give back to my community to build uh, schools and to uh, make sure that the Uh, girls uh, in my village, in my community, they don't have to go through what I'm going through. And when she said, I'm going to donate 1.5 million, I thought I was dreaming. I I tried to visualize what 1 million looks like and what 500,000 looks like. I had never envisioned anything like that. I think it's really remarkable. I was just thinking about this. You know, on this podcast, we have conversations with a lot of people who, you know, have made huge impacts in the world. And and maybe some of them have gotten, you know, millions of dollars donated. But these are oftentimes people who are running a nonprofit and they specifically know, okay, well, Here's what I'm going to do with, you know, a million and a half dollars when I when I'm given it. You were just somebody with a dream. You said, you know, I live in this community and I want to break this cycle and I know that I can do this through education and then after I achieve my own education I will use my experience growing up in addition to my newfound amazing education and I'm going to make an impact in my community and so you know, you being given a million and a half dollars is profound and I would imagine overwhelming because, you know, then you get to, you just have all these dreams and plans and ideas on how you can use this and and, and what this can look like. And I think that's just a really special, beautiful thing that you had such a pure heart receiving this. And uh, what was the process of, of seeing those schools come to life in your community like? You know, uh, let me just say that Oprah gave me um, the platform to excel. She she brought another organization, uh, Save the Children, to manage the the funding. And um, for me to go into the community and walk through the campus and to see 
especially this one school which is accommodating almost 1900 kids and to see a community library we never had community library in our in our own communities and to see computers in this remote part of Zimbabwe kids sitting and uh, using computers is profound and this school let me say this school with 1900 kids school has been in existence for 60 years and for those 60 years it was built during the colonial era and for those 60 years no child from this school graduated from first grade all the way to high school and had an opportunity to go to university. No child had gone to university. So when Oprah gave us this funding and for the first time in 2014, 15, 16, we have children that have graduated and going to colleges. We even have a student right now attending a college, one of the best colleges, University of Zimbabwe, and uh, doing business studies. Uh, his name is McDonald. And we have another kid who is at University of Algeria doing medicine. And we have several others that are doing teaching and nursing. So what Oprah did is huge. She enabled the blind to see the uneducated to get education, enabled us to break that, that baton, the baton of poverty that we, some of us, had been handed from generations before. And now we excel, we walk with dignity, and it's, it's just amazing to see these children walking long distances, running to school, and loving what they are learning. And that wouldn't have happened without you. You know, you're crediting Oprah and, and Oprah is generous and amazing and we all love Oprah, but you pursued your dream and and you brought it to life. And I think that's, it's so inspiring to me. And it's so incredible that you've lived out this story and that this story has had such an incredible impact on your community. And you've had this incredible impact on your community. And, you know, like I alluded to earlier, you have this new book that came out and it's absolutely beautiful. I love it. You know, tell me about the process of bringing this to life and and how has that been for you? You know, I speak around the world and I have addressed the United Nations and I've done all these things. And one question that keeps coming is, can you tell us how did you achieve your dreams? Uh, and um, so I realized many women wanted to learn from my own process. But I also realized um, I wasn't the only one who had achieved their dreams. There were so many women who felt silenced uh, at one time in their lives, and they broke that silence and awakened their dreams. So I weaved my stories with many other women. I met a young lawyer, Leah. She she went to school and she became a lawyer, but inside of her, there was this awakening that, no, I am not a lawyer. I am an artist. And she was silenced by the society that expected her to do legal work, to be a lawyer. But she knew she's an, she's an artist. So she broke from that. And today she is doing all kinds of fascinating artwork and also working with women, uh, being a coach and selling these beautiful arts around the world. And I met a woman, Miran, uh, who was a lawyer and denied the promotion to be a judge because of her gender. And today she refused to be silenced and she's working with, with women all over the world. I met another woman, Diana Ramsey. She uh, she co-founded Iowa Women Lead Change. But before that, she had been going through her own struggles and she refused those struggles to silence her. And she came up with this 
organization that is really making impact on, on women in Iowa and across Iowa. And I met Michelle. Michelle was going through a divorce process when I met her. She had me speak at an event and she went home and wrote down her dreams and buried them in her garden. And she comes back to me and she said, you know what, Tererai? I have achieved my dreams. And so I have all these women who inspired me, who are doing all kinds of things. And I realize, what about if we collectively get all this energy, this feminine energy, we can bring these gifts together and we can change the world because the silencing of one woman is our own silencing and the awakening of women is the awakening of the whole world. It's so inspiring and encouraging and I feel like I personally grew a lot through the process of hearing all of these stories of incredible women and it feels like such an incredible time in history for women. Of course, you know, we're not there yet, but we're past the start. And I'm just so inspired by you and this coalition of women who are rising up and and making this incredible impact in the world because we need your voices and we need your stories so much. When I got your book, uh, I, I read the cover and, and I knew that it was called The Awakened Woman, but I didn't process fully that uh, this was a little bit of a a manifesto or a, or a lesson book for women, just, you know, on how, how women can follow the same path that you followed and, and step towards further empowerment. And I was just reading the book and I'm like, I connect with, with this so much. Uh, and it's a really, really special book. And I know that the book is filled with a lot of rituals and, and tools and recommendations on, on how people can, you know, follow down your path, not necessarily to become the next Dr. Trent, but to become themselves in a more full way and to realize their dreams. And it's beautiful because reading your book, you can see that your dreams, you know, coming to life has this profound impact and will have a profound impact for generations. How would you recommend that people start, you know, women, but also, you know, people like me, men who are just inspired and encouraged and and want to pursue our dreams in in a real way and, and not only that but to realize them you know where where can we start and how can we move through that process you know uh, before the program you talked about um uh, the shootings in um in las vegas and uh the hurricanes and all these things and i i always ask people what breaks your heart it is in that brokenness that we find the stirring, the awakening of our dreams. So I encourage um, listeners to find, to ask themselves, what breaks my heart? And for you, you know, in your own life, what broke your heart was, you know, this baton continuing to be passed on uh, when you know, you knew that education could stop that. And I think that's beautiful. And so when you, when, when you realize what breaks your heart, then write down those things and, and, and think about the awakening of a dream that comes out of, your, out of that process and write down those dreams. You know, I encourage uh, everyone to write down their dreams. But the dreams, they also have to be sacred to you. They also have to be accompanied by rituals. And we have to go beyond your own dreams. I'm always reminded by the Native Americans and um, most of the indigenous people when they say humankind has not woven the web of life. We are one thread within it. Whatever we do to the web, we do it to ourselves. All things are bound together together. All things are connected. Our very survival is connected to the survival of others. So it's important to have dreams that go beyond ourselves. Absolutely beautiful. One more question really quick. Tell me, where is 
the original note that you wrote down, the letter you wrote of your goals and your dreams. You know, you checked off those first three boxes on your on your first visit back. Were you able to go back and, and retrieve it and check off the remaining boxes? Yes. In fact, when I was about to uh, graduate with my PhD, I brought my 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 can, my dream can with my dreams, and the uh, president of uh, Western Michigan University, Dr. Dan, had to he, he checked that fourth dream, and um, I had brought it that I could check it for myself. Then I then I heard rumors that uh, he was giving commencement speeches for all those who were graduating and he was using my story. So I approached him and I said, would you mind? And he said, oh, my gosh. So he checked that fourth dream. And I have kept that um, all my dreams in their old uh, can uh, as, a, as a remembrance. And I think uh, as I... I get older, uh, in my old age, I want to give it to my great-granddaughter. So to remind her never to let this baton uh, come back, but to carry on a much more re- a, a much more defined baton, a new recreated baton. Because right now, you know, my I brought with me, I, I you know, I have a nine-year-old girl that uh, came with me. Even though I have another, I had another twelve-year-old girl, but I came with my nine-year-old and uh, three other girls. And uh, today, uh, she graduated with a mechanical engineering degree. And I have another girl; she's doing biomedical sciences at Western Michigan University. So it shows I. I am passing on, I redefined that baton of poverty, that baton of illiteracy, of early marriage, redefined it in a way that I'm passing on a baton of good education, a baton of engineers, a a baton of dignity, because it's through education that we get our dignity through our own empowerment, through refusing to be silenced, we get dignity as women. What an incredible woman. Tara is the kind of legendary voice that simultaneously tells us that we are born to fulfill a sacred dream and compels us to start that important work of restoration in our own communities no matter how impossible that work might seem. I I think I most connected with this quote where she said, the secret to our success is when our personal dreams and goals are connected to the betterment of our community. That's the sacred dream, allowing others to stand on our shoulders as they let us stand on their shoulders. If you're new to Sounds Good, we would love for you to stick around. Of course, uh, just hit the subscribe button and you'll be able to listen to some of our all-time favorite episodes as we air them week by week here in the feed. Uh, You can also scroll back through and find some of our old previous episodes. Find somebody that you connect with. Also, if you liked this episode and you especially like the Oprah angle, you should also listen to our episode about probably like 25 episodes back with Kendall Seesmeyer. She uh, has this remarkable story of her interactions with Kim Kardashian and President Donald Trump and Oprah Winfrey and and somehow how all of these things intersected in a weird way to make the world a better oh my gosh I just I you just gotta listen to it I'm not even gonna say anymore (laughs) Uh, this podcast is created by me Brandon Harvey as a part of good 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 a community that believes in the power of celebrating good news and becoming good news Chad Michael Snavely of the team and CM studio edit and mix our show you can find lots more helpful stories on social media by following us everywhere at Good 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 CO. And we also create a beautiful quarterly newspaper, a free weekly email newsletter, and this podcast right here. And you can learn more about all of those things and more at goodgoodgood.co. And on that note, that is a wrap for this week's episode. Go out and do some good this week, and we'll be back next week with another inspiring story from an incredible person. Sound good?